Be seated. Today we begin a three-part Christmas series looking at the Christmas story and seeing some applications for today. I invite you to take your Bibles today and go to Luke chapter number 2. And we'll read uh, Luke 2, probably the first of a couple, several times uh, this season, that you will read the Christmas story. We'll, of course, read it here in church a number of times. And then uh, we have a tradition in our home, I'm sure you have one as well, where you read the story before you open presents. It's a good way to remind ourselves of the, the spiritual dimension of what, we, uh, of what we do and why we do it. And so we'll be looking today at the worship of Christmas and then uh, next week at the wonder of Christmas and on Christmas Eve we'll be looking at the waiting for Christmas. Uh, that's uh, the plan at least and we'll see what happens. But uh, thank you for being here today. Our Bibles are open to Luke chapter 2 and for this morning let's read verses 1 through 11, shall we? The Bible says, And it came to pass in those days... There went out a decree from Caesar Augustus that all the world should be taxed. And this taxing was first made when Cyrenius was governor of Syria. And all went to be taxed, every one unto his own city. And Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, unto the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be taxed with Mary, his espoused wife, being great with child. And so it was that while they were there, the days were accomplished that she should be delivered. She brought forth her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling clothes and laid him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were in the same country shepherds abiding in the field, keeping watch over their flock by night. And lo, the angel of the Lord came upon them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were sore afraid." And the angel said unto them, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, which is Christ the Lord. Well, part one of our Christmas series today is entitled this morning, The Worship of Christmas. It's a lot of things. Christmas is a lot of things. It means a lot of different things to different people, but it should predominantly be a reason to worship the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Let's pray, and we'll look in the message today. Father, once again, we bow our heads and our hearts, and we come before you uh, needy today, um, sinful we need to be stirred and shaken back to Christ today, back to our purpose for living, back to our reason for living, and that is to bring glory to you. And I pray that in all the, the busyness of this season that it will be for us as believers a time of worship. And Lord, we always want the Christmas story to hit us with uh, with a, a fresh sense of awe. And I pray that, uh, that today, especially, we will see some of the details of this story with, with new eyes and new ears, and that you'll restore to us the wonder and the worship of what was given, what was provided for us by that, that baby in a manger. God, thank you that your ways are way beyond our ways, that your thoughts are, are much higher than our thoughts and that you chose to accomplish your will in this way. I pray, Lord, that you would uh, draw us closer to our Savior today, draw us closer to you in a relationship that seeks to ascribe worth and to give you the glory that is due your name. And that all, that all of our stress, God, that all of our, our uh, emotions and all of our fatigue and our worry will be, will be preempted by worship of who you are and what you've done for us today. We pray, Lord, for those who are here today and those that are watching online uh, now or later that their needs would be met and that uh, you would touch our service right now. We ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. <sighs> Do you feel overwhelmed yet? <laughs> when December rolls around, our schedule gets uh, very, very full. Uh, there are parties uh, uh, for hosting and marshmallows for burning. And uh, uh, 
We have two daughters born in December, which is why I call December Bankruptcy Awareness Month, uh, because of the birthdays and the gifts. And um, by the way, I have a daughter that turned 20 yesterday. I, I know I look so young. Um, and Karen has no gray hair, I, no gray hair at all. But uh, the, I, I don't mean to frighten you. I don't mean to add stress to your life today. But uh, there are only 14 days of shopping left. Only 14 shopping days left, so you, you, better, uh, you better get out there or let your fingers and your mouse do the walking over to Amazon.com uh, to order what you need to take care of. I know that some of you have been done since the 4th of July uh, with your Christmas shopping. With the rest of us, we call, we call ourselves normal people. Uh, we still have a way to go. Uh, we're, we're, we're way behind. I read about a couple of guys a few days before Christmas. Uh, they, uh, their wives went shopping, uh, and two men in Florida decided to go out on their sailboat, go out on a boat, uh, while their wives were doing Christmas shopping. And while the men were out there sailing, a terrible storm arose. And uh, they had great difficulty keeping the, the, the boat under control. And, and they managed to maneuver their boat a little closer to the shore, but they got grounded on a sandbar. Well, they jumped out, they jumped overboard, and they had to push with all their might, just trying to get that boat back into deeper water. As they were doing this, the wind was kicking up, the storm was coming down. It was very scary. They're, covered, they're, they're soaking wet. They're, 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 they're knees to, to their knees to their feet deep in mud. And one of the guys looked at the other, at his friend, and said, you know... This sure beats Christmas shopping, though. <laughs> Amen, right. <laughs> well, in all seriousness, more than a season of shopping, Christmas should be a season of worship. Everyone can worship, by the way. Everyone here worships something. You are living your life, you are establishing priorities and, and procedures and making decisions in your life. You are revealing to the world what your priorities are. You are revealing right now that uh, 1015 on a Sunday morning uh, is a priority for you to gather in worship, either in person or online. You, you, we, we reveal what's important to us by our attitude towards it and by the actions we demonstrate to keep that a priority so everyone here can worship. Indeed, everyone is worshiping. Everyone here should enjoy worship. We find all these different groups of people and their different reactions to the Christmas story in this news of Jesus Christ. The shepherds were these common working men. These, these were the, the, the blue-collar people, uh, and they worshiped. The shepherds were common men, but they worshipped. The, the wise men were sophisticated, and they were intelligent, and they were wealthy, but they knew who they worshipped as well. Both the commoners and the elite engaged in the worship of baby Jesus. Well, worship means to ascribe worth toward. Worship means to elevate something, to shine the light on something, to give something priority in your life. You can worship the Lord Jesus Christ with singing, with serving, uh, by sharing your faith. You can worship God by, by, by giving. You can worship God by, by simply having a heart of faith that is yielded and surrendered to Him. You can worship inwardly like Mary, who the Bible says pondered all these things and kept them in her heart. Or you can worship very outwardly like the heavenly host of angels who filled the sky and the glory of God blazed across the heavens. The point is, that you and I take the time to slow down enough to worship Christ this season. Let me give you three points to help us with the worship of Christmas. Number one, we worship because of his purpose. We worship because of the purpose, of the sovereignty of God, uh, how the plan of God unfolds here in verses one through six of Luke chapter two. Listen, beloved, there is a, a wonderful and grand design to this remarkable story that unfolds for us uh, here in Luke chapter 2. You know a little bit about it. Because of a legal demand that was placed on all the citizens of the area, uh, placed on them by Rome, by the way, Joseph and Mary were forced to travel from uh, Nazareth, where their hometown, to Bethlehem, uh, some 70, 80, or 90 miles away. 
Mary was in her latter stages of pregnancy. So a three or four day trip uh, would be strenuous and stressful and painful, not to mention dangerous. There was, a, back then, of course, there were no, no safe cars, no planes, no trains, and not even really a safe donkey. You walked or you rode a horse or, or a donkey or, or something like that across dangerous country with animals like uh, lions and, and wolves and, and thieves as well along the path. There would have been the added expenses in taking a trip. Anytime you have to put gas in your car or take a, a trip on a weekend or go on vacation, it costs money. The same, life hasn't changed. There would have been added expenses involved in making this trip, something that someone who is about to give birth to a baby doesn't need extra uh, expenses. So there was going to be a census taken, and so Rome decided, well, in order to accurately tax everyone, we have to count everyone. And so let's require everyone to go back to their town of birth, back to their hometown to register. And, and so it, all this is going to cost them more money. Now, through the eyes of these probably teenagers, these, these, these uh, 15, 16, 17, whatever age that Mary was and Joseph were, through the eyes of Joseph and Mary, this they would have been forced to make this expensive trip because of some wild decree by a guy named Caesar Augustus. From a purely human perspective, this was a very difficult moment, but from a divine perspective, this was a critical moment. This was an important moment. Um, what Joseph and Mary did not know, what we know now, is that God had orchestrated this whole situation and put them exactly where he wanted them to be so that he could get them to Bethlehem. So they could fulfill Micah 5.2, which says that God is going to bring a Savior to the little town of Bethlehem. The author of that Christmas carol got it right. Bethlehem was a tiny little town, tiny little hamlet. Why Bethlehem? Why did God bring the good news of salvation to a little town of Bethlehem? You know, uh, the announcement of Jesus' birth, the arrival of the Savior of the world, it, it, it could have been given to Rome, the political capital of the world. But it didn't come to Rome. It also, the news of Jesus, the birth of Jesus, did not come to Athens, the economic center of the world at the time. The news of Jesus did not get to Alexandria, Egypt, which was the educational capital of the world. And this news and this arrival of Jesus didn't even happen in Jerusalem, which of course is the religious capital of the world. So why, why in the world would the Savior, would the King of Kings be born in a little tiny place called Bethlehem? And here's the reason, my friends. It's to illustrate, it's to demonstrate that Jesus comes for all people. For just regular people, common people in this world. Not, not the educational, not the economically elite, not the politically successful, not the religious crowd. Jesus comes to the commoners, the kind of people that live in the Chattanoogas of this world, in the Bethlehem of the Christmas story. And it shows us that no matter how untimely or how unusual or how unsettling a situation or a circumstance in our life might be, God is sovereignly accomplishing his purpose even when we can't see it at the moment. He is sovereignly accomplishing his perfect will. And that statement that, of course, applies to the Christmas story, that God, no matter how untimely, how unseemly, how unfortunate, how inconvenient the things might seem to be around us, God is always accomplishing his purpose, that statement is just as true today as it was when Jesus was born. And that is a truth that should uh, uh, help us today. That's a truth that should transform our thinking today. That's a truth that should change our doubts and our frustrations about what God is doing into worship of him instead. I'm encouraged, think about it this way, that God's purposes are accomplished even through a government initiative. That God's purposes can still be accomplished even through a negative government decision. 
Do you think we see some negative government decisions around us in these days? Can I get a, a hello or a yes or something? All right, if you don't respond, I'll start over. All right, so there, I got you. And, and let's, let's rest and let's worship God knowing that even though there are, remember what the Bible says in Proverbs uh, uh, 21, one, it says the king's heart is in the hand of the Lord and as the rivers of water, he turneth it wherever he wills. So God uses heathen people in heathen political offices with heathen political powers. God uses people like that to accomplish his will and his purpose and his program. That's precisely what's happening here. God used taxes. Did you hear me? God used taxes to accomplish his purpose. A silly story, but there was a man on vacation in, uh, he was at a hotel in Acapulco and he was enjoying himself, enjoying the sunny weather of Mexico. And suddenly uh, he was distracted by the screams of a woman who was kneeling in front of a child. And the man knew enough Spanish to determine that the, the small child had swallowed a coin. So he went over there and he seized that child by the heels and he turned that child upside down and he gave that child a few shakes and the quarter dropped to the sidewalk. Oh, Thank you, sir, cried the woman. Uh, she said, you seem to know exactly what to do to get the money out of him. Are you a doctor? He said, no, ma'am, I'm with the Internal Revenue Service of the United States. <laughs> God works in unusual ways through a negative government initiative, through taxes. Isaiah 55, eight and nine, the Bible says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so were my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Two times God tells us, leave it to me. My ways are not your ways, my thoughts are not your thoughts. Did you get that? My thoughts are not your thoughts, my ways are not your ways, but I'm the Lord and you're not. So that, that introduces faith into our life. That introduces worship. And, and because this, this is a God that, who, who rules the heavens and the earth and it's because he works according to his own ways, I can just take my hands off and I can worship. I want to put my hands on so many times. I want to control. I want to fix it. I want to do what I can do. But instead of just pausing and pondering and praising and seeing what God is doing. Ultimately, Joseph and Mary would not have chosen this as the setting to bring peace and joy to their lives. There's probably some things happened to you in the last 10 or 11 months of 2023 that you would not have chosen. You would not have scripted it out. You would not have said, you know, I, I, I want this relative to pass away. I, I want this financial situation to collapse in my life. Or, or I want, I want the, this diagnosis medically to happen. There's probably some things that, that, that you look back and I, I, this is unsettling. This is untimely. This is unusual what I am going through today. But I'm, I'm here to encourage us. You can either respond to God's timing with frustration or you can respond to what God is doing with faith and joy. It's your choice. You can either respond with frustration and you can get upset, you can become bitter, you can allow it to eat away at your soul or you can respond with faith and joy knowing that God must be up to something a whole lot higher and a whole lot better and more excellent than I can even imagine. Because truly he was up to that in Luke chapter two. I don't always understand the circumstances of life. People ask me for answers. And I don't have answers, but I can direct you to who. <laughs> I don't know what or when or how or all the answers, but I can tell you there is a God and there is a Savior who loves you and a God who is in control. And I don't understand all the circumstances of life. But I know that God is at work and he can use a trial to bring us back. He can use a financial difficulty to bring us back. He can use a wayward child to bring us back. We serve a God who never sleeps and never slumbers and he can use anything, and I mean anything, to do whatever he wants to do so that his purpose, his purpose. All right. We worship, we worship because God's accomplishing something way beyond what we can even see. Worship him. I would suggest, secondly, we not only worship because of his purpose, we worship because of his provision. 
We worship because of the gift of Jesus that was given. This is obvious, of course. After unwrapping all of her presents one Christmas morning, a little girl was asked, did you get everything you wanted for Christmas? And she said, after thinking for a moment, no, I didn't get everything I wanted, but then again, it's not my birthday. We get so caught up in all the hustle and bustle. We get so enamored with the exchanging of gifts and the receiving of gifts. We forget the greatest gift, the greatest gift. In all reality, the reason why we exchange gifts at Christmas time is to remind us of the gift of Jesus that came to earth to die for our sins. I used to love the Dennis the Menace show and Dennis the Menace cartoons. Well, in one Dennis the Menace cartoon, Dennis and Joey are looking in a department store window that has been all decked out for Christmas. And Dennis says, last month was our giving thanks holiday and Christmas is God's way of saying, you're welcome. God just keeps on giving. God just keeps bestowing his blessings on us. What? We, we, we worship God for the purpose of things we can't really see, we can't feel and touch, we don't really know what's going on, but there are plenty of things, my friends, that we can hold and touch, and you can open up your banking app and say, man, praise God for his provision. You can look at your house, look at your, the cars you drive, you can look at how God has met your needs, how, how God has provided you, the people around you, uh, the, 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 the means to make money in the job that you have, the health that you have. You can look around very easily at the provisions God has given you and you can thank God for that. But there's specifically a provision of salvation. What was God providing? Even though the world might not have understood it in the context of Luke chapter 2, what was God providing that day that makes it such a great provision? Well, I would suggest first he was providing redemption. He was providing redemption. Now listen to me carefully. Sin and death had passed upon all men for that all have sinned. Adam and Eve introduced sin and a sin nature and sin's consequences into the human race. And there, we needed to be redeemed. We needed, we needed to have something done to keep us from going to hell because sin destines people to hell. There are consequences for the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life, and so sin requires a payment. Uh, we could never purchase that, that salvation on our own. We could never purchase our redemption on our own. And that's why God sent Jesus in the flesh, a priceless gift. No one's ever got you a gift that is as priceless as the gift of Jesus Christ and his precious blood that were shed to cleanse you from your sin and to purchase you back. He was born to die on that cross. And this, this was his ultimate purpose for coming to earth. And this brings us back again to why Bethlehem? Why, what is it? That there, Bethlehem was known for two things. The first thing Bethlehem was known for was that all the grain that was produced there, uh, they turned it into bread. In Hebrew, it's Bet Lechem. It's the house of bread. And I, I'm going to tell you that bread is for everyone. If you go down to, um, oh, what's that nice steak place? Ruth's Chris Steakhouse. If you go down to that steakhouse some point uh, and have a nice meal, you'll pay $200, $300 for that meal. They're going to give you some really good bread. If you go over there at Texas Roadhouse, the dumbest question they ever ask at Texas Roadhouse is, do you want rolls? Don't ask me. Put them on the table. Where's the butter? <laughs> if you go down to McDonald's and order a number one Big Mac extra value meal, they're going to give you something they call meat between three slices of bread. <laughs> it doesn't matter. If you're black or white, rich or poor, smart or unintelligent, doesn't matter your social class, uh, your economic status, uh, bread is for everyone. Someone gave us a loaf of homemade sourdough bread and we ate it up yesterday. Bread is one of the most basic needs we have. 
Jesus Christ in John is described as the bread of life. The bread of life came to the house of bread, Bethlehem, the house of bread, to, to illustrate that people's most basic needs can be met by Jesus Christ. But there, I told you there are two things that Bethlehem was known for. The first is the house of bread. The second is it is the place where they raised lambs for temple sacrifice. Shepherding was huge. A lot of shepherds there, a lot of sheep, a lot of lambs. And these lambs were raised, they were cultivated because uh, uh, during all the, the, the celebrations, religious holidays, thousands and thousands of lambs were slain. The blood of lambs uh, uh, fell off the altars and went through the cracks of the temple and went down there into in the valley of Kidron there and, and it, just, it flooded the area. Blood was all uh, sacrificed out of these lambs and all that to show that the Lamb of God, John called, when, when John saw Jesus coming, John the Baptist saw Jesus coming in John chapter 1, he says, behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sins of the world. What was God providing when he sent that, that, that shepherd, that, that, that sheep to Bethlehem, the house of earth? He was providing for man's most basic need, providing that redemption through that baby in the hay who came to die for our sins. Secondly, God was providing a relationship. Not just one of those things where, hey, let, 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 let me give you some benevolence and you go on your merry way, leave me alone. Here's five bucks. Don't, don't waste it on, on booze and alcohol. L not, not, let me, let me get, get out of jail. Not, not let me pay this debt for you and then just leave me alone. No, God wanted a relationship with us. For in him, the Bible says in Colossians, dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. He was the Son of God and the Son of Man, fully God, fully human. And the, I love John 1.14, and the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Emmanuel, God with us. In the manger, Jesus was fully God and fully man. In his earthly ministry at 30 to 33, he was fully God and fully man. On the cross, he was fully God and fully man. Resurrecting, he was fully God and fully man. He intercedes before us today, uh, retaining some of those human characteristics so he can be our high priest who is touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but he is fully deity, fully God in the flesh. God with us. There's certain people, can I be honest with you, I don't want to be with them. Certain people I can't stand to be around them. Not nobody here, I'm talking about other people outside this church. Certain people irk me, annoy me, rub me the wrong way. I just don't jive with them. Can I get a witness? You know what I'm talking about? Let's just be real, okay? We have our friends, we have our frenemies. You understand that God wants to be with us? It don't make any sense. Because I know me. <laughs> and I know sometimes the way I act, people don't want to be around me. There, I'll be fair. You say, yeah, I think that way about you, Pastor, yeah. There's times when people don't want to be around me because the way I act. Does that make any sense? That God would, would, would want to be with us. There's nothing desirable about us. What's so, we're not, you're not special. None of us here are special. It's a miracle that God would become like us, humble himself as a man, take on the form of a servant, and come to die for us so that we could be reconciled to him. All for what? Man, think about your life. Not all the Christmassy things you've done, not all the, not all the fluffy good stuff you've done, but the bad stuff you've done. Think about your life. The fact that God would choose to in, enter the soap opera of your life, to enter your life with all your misery and all your sin and all your problems, there's nothing good about you. There's nothing good about me. In fact, quite the opposite, right? We deserve to be cast out of the presence of God, and yet he enters into our world with his presence. It's amazing that when I could not go to where he was, he came to me. He came to me. He went the distance. He stretched out his arm of love and grace 
so that I could have a relationship with him. Jesus said, I will go and dwell among them so that one day I could dwell in them so that one day they can come and dwell with us in heaven. There is no greater provision than that. The two needs I have in my life are redemption and relationship. I need someone to save me from my sins and I need someone to love me right where I am. And Jesus does both of those things just comes in a way that we wouldn't expect. But don't we see it? Don't you get it? Everything you ever need at this point in the story is wrapped up in swaddling clothes and lying in a manger. And the world has no room for that. The world has no time for that. So right now I'm asking all of us as believers, if you are a believer to, today, to make some room and make some time to worship God for this provision. There's a third point. We worship God because of his purpose, because of his provision, and finally we worship because of his promise. Promise. We, we worship because the birth of Jesus Christ, we recognize this, or, or you should, or maybe you're learning this right now, that the birth of Jesus Christ was the culmination of hundreds of years of saying it was going to happen. Prediction. I said on Wednesday, one-fifth of the entire scripture, one-fifth of the Bible was future, was prediction when it was written. And many of those prophecies have to do with Jesus Christ, his first coming and his second coming. So this culmination we worship because that this is the culmination of hundreds of years of promises that are perfectly fulfilled in Jesus Christ. Professor Peter Stoner, you'll love this, I love to tell this story and illustrate this. Professor Peter Stoner set out to demonstrate uh, using scientific methods that uh, all the prophecies concerning the Messiah could not have been fulfilled by chance or just accidentally. Well, Stoner, this professor, uh, calculated, he started by calculating the possibility that, that there would be one individual who could fulfill just eight prophecies concerning Jesus Christ. And he computed the odds at that to be one in 10 to the 17th power, the same as one followed by 17 zeros. That's the equivalent he illustrated very uh, 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 visibly in this analogy. That's the equivalent of covering the entire state of Texas two feet deep with silver dollars specifically marking only one of them with an X and then instructing a blindfolded man to wander out in the entire state of Texas and the chances of him choosing the right silver dollar that you have marked on the first try are less. That's more likely, I should say, than the chances of eight prophecies being fulfilled literally in Jesus Christ. But wait, there's more. Dr. Stoner then computed the odds that one individual could fulfill 48 prophecies that are said of Christ. He calculated those odds at 1 times 10 to the 157th power, or 1 followed by 157 zeros, or this week's mega million jackpot. This figure of one followed by 157 zeros, I don't, I can't comprehend that. It's beyond our, it's astronomical. It's beyond our human comprehension. But, but that's uh, the chances of one fulfilling eight and one fulfilling 48 prophecies. Let me tell you this, church, that Christ fulfilled about 300 prophecies when he came to earth the first time. And not just that. 
These prophecies, these over 300 prophecies were written by different men from different professions, living in different time periods from shepherd to king uh, over the span of 1,400 years in three different languages on two separate continents. The harmony of scriptures and the, uh, when it comes to pointing to the Savior and to these eventual fulfillments of these prophecies, it's astounding. It's unbelievable. But it's true. It, by the way, it makes us realize that if all these hundreds of prophecies were fulfilled the first time Jesus came, I probably should pay attention to the prophecies that point out to the second time he's going to come. They're probably true as well. Hope you caught the sarcasm in that statement. It was promised to us. Have you ever gotten, have you ever been promised a gift you never got? Anybody think, okay, raise your hand, you've been promised a gift you never got, all right? I, uh, I think some of you are lying, all right? Uh, you're just like, I'm not raising my hand, I'm just not gonna do it. You're, back when you were eight, your parents promised you something. And they failed because they're human. They failed because they're imperfect or because you got on their nerves and they decided to change their mind, right? We've been promised certain things and we never, but did you know that, that the promise of Christmas, the promise of a Messiah, the promise of a solution to the sin problem that that Adam and Eve caused in Genesis chapter 3, the promised solution starts in Genesis 3.15. Like God wastes no time. The promise of the Messiah, the Christmas promise that God would send the world a gift that would crush sin, that would defeat hell and provide redemption to the seed of man, that was in Genesis 3.15, that he would send the world that gift and he kept his promise. The world was promised a savior and God delivered on that promise. So I close by reminding all of us the point of this message today is to remember that Christmas is about worshiping Jesus. And, and maybe you could think about getting just a little bit more extreme in your worship. Well, I don't wanna go overboard. I don't think we need to fear getting extravagant or, or an outpouring of emotion when it comes to worship. There was another lady named Mary in the scriptures. There's you know, six or seven Marys in the Bible, but another one named Mary in the scriptures sat at the feet of Jesus and she worshiped while her sister Martha did stuff. And, and, and Mary's, uh, Martha's like, I'm getting stuff done. I got stuff to do. I might have heard that from a lady named Karen yesterday or this week. You know, I got stuff to do. You've said it. I know we all got stuff to do. I don't have time for Christmas. And Martha's like, I got stuff to do. Tell her to quit worshiping and help. And help. I need help. I need dishes and the biscuits and all this stuff. Please. Take time to sit at the feet of Jesus. Let the gifts stay unwrapped. Let the, the lights on that decoration be burnt out. Let all those gifts that you're planning to give to someone, just make sure that you sit at the feet of Jesus for a while and thank God for the provision of a Redeemer and a relationship with him. I don't know what you want for Christmas. You probably know what you want. But Jesus wants your worship. We can give Jesus what he wants. We can give God what he deserves for Christmas. We can give him our worship. So don't you get more excited in a few days about some gadget or some game, or some garment, more than you get excited about God sending his son to die on the cross. Don't you get more fired up about some piece of jewelry 
Don't you treasure some jewelry more than you treasure Jesus Christ? Truly is the greatest thing that has ever been given to you. He is the gift <laughs> that keeps on giving. You know, back then there were two groups of people that reacted very differently to the news of Jesus. There were those that worshipped the Lord extravagantly and there were those that didn't get it. I think we know which group we should be in. Most of our world doesn't get the true reason behind Christmas, but we do. And if you know that reason, turn it into extravagant worship of your Savior and Lord. And before we pray, may I say this. Christmas is a wonderful time to realize you need something you might not have. And that's a Savior to save you from your sins. So if you don't have a Redeemer or a relationship, would you, would you replay the message, replay the Christmas story and realize that there is a whole purpose and a whole plan for God to send this provision of his son. He promised he would do it and he delivered on the promise. He told us he was going to, then he did. And I'm telling you what's happened. Jesus came to earth and he died on the cross so that you could have a relationship. He came to be among us so we could dwell in us, so we could go dwell with him in heaven one day. And if you're without Christ, you can't truly worship this Christmas till you know the Savior personally. And if you need to know Christ today, we can help you with that. We can introduce you to a Savior by taking the word of God and your consent to tell you about what Jesus Christ has done personally for you. Whatever you know about Christmas, turn it into extravagant worship for your Savior, Jesus. Let's pray. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. I invite you to stand this morning with us as we have our invitation time. I want to talk first to those of you that are here today with our heads bowed and our eyes closed from everyone here, heads bowed, eyes closed. I want to talk to you first about those who are just so busy and you're so, you're so stressed. The hustle and bustle. It's things to do, Pastor. I have things to do. Even today I have things to do. But when it comes to that slowing down and pondering and pausing and praising, you recognize that is the, the main need of your life. And if you, if you put priority on worshiping Jesus today, if you put priority on praising God today, then all the other things would take care of themselves. It's going to be okay, my friends. It's going to be all right. So calm your heart, calm your spirit, and get your heart into an attitude of worship, an attitude of praise, appreciation, extravagant love, and willing surrender and sacrifice and service for all that God has done for you. We're talking today about the worship of Christmas. Now how many of you here would say that something in the message that God spoke to your heart whether it's his purpose or his provision or the fulfilled promises or something, a need not mentioned by me, but something the Holy Spirit connected with you in your heart about the worship, about just enjoying and, and turning this time as a believer to worship. God spoke to you today and you're asking God to help you walk through and follow through with that decision today. God spoke to you. Would you raise your hand today? Amen. Many, many hands. Several dozen hands today. God bless you. So what needs to be replaced? What needs to be removed? And what, what needs to be changed so that you don't walk out of here the same? So that you leave as a worshiper and not as a worrier? Just a moment, I invite you to come. And I also invite anyone here that doesn't know Christ to come. Our assistant pastor will be here. You can come forward if you go out to the lobby and tell someone that you'd like to know Christ as your Savior, that's a very a little more private way to do it. You can go out to the lobby and someone can help you there. But don't leave here without a knowledge 
of a home in heaven and a personal savior. Let's pray. I know there are some different things here around the stage. It's okay. There's still a warm altar at Calvary Baptist Church. If you need to worship today, you find yourself a little corner and call out to God. And let's get our priorities right so that the next 14 or 15 days of this Christmas season can be ones of worship. Our Father in heaven, thank you for our time today, for a chance to walk through the Christmas story. I ask that you'll continue to work in our hearts and work in our lives. And uh, Lord, as we, we want to shape our, our attitudes and our actions right now around the worship of Christmas, I ask, Lord, that this would be a time where uh, we are filled with awe and joy and thanksgiving for all that was done so that we could have a Savior, so we could have a relationship with God, the creator of the universe. So fill us with wonder and excitement and help us to remove all the things that are in the way of our worship this morning. I pray for those that need to know you as their Savior personally, that today they'll find what's missing in their life. We ask all this in Jesus' name.